So let's move on now to the left side of the heart. And you're all well aware now that the normal venoatrial connections are for the four pulmonary veins to drain into the roof of the morphologically left atrium. And malformations of the pulmons are much easier to understand than on the right side, or rather not easier to understand, but the list is less extensive than it was on the right side. So to emphasize again our normal arrangement of pulmonary venous connections, we have veins draining the right lung and the left lung to the dome of the left atrium. As Andrew has already said, we now know from experience from treatment of arrhythmias that there is marked variation in the number of veins opening on both sides. And we even know now that some veins can open directly into the roof of the left atrium. But basically, we can consider two veins from the left, two veins from the right, opening by four orifices at the corner of the left atrial roof. Note again the course of the persistent left superior cable vein, if present, between the left-sided pulmonary veins and the left atrial appendage. And note again the location of the coronary sinus. I emphasize this yet again. Although opening into the right atrium, the coronary sinus is a component of the morphologically atrioventricular junction. And now the key to understanding anomalous pulmonary veins is to distinguish between anomalous connections and anomalous drainage. Because you've already seen that the pulmonary veins can be normally connected to the left atrium, yet still drain anomalously because of the coexistence of an intact atrial septum and mitral atresia. And that, of course, is in the setting of levoatrial cardinal vein. And Andrew has just shown you a beautiful example of that malformation. And I've shown you that we can also have normally connected but anomalously draining pulmonary veins in the setting of fenestration of the coronary sinus. But what we're now concerned is with the connections of the pulmonary veins when they themselves are anomalous. So we need to describe these connections. And as we have seen, the normal connection is sandwiched between the systemic venous connections, the right-sided connections to the right atrium and the track of the left superior cable vein. But what we're particularly concerned about now in the setting of anomalous pulmonary venous connection is how much of the lung drains anomalously. And the most obvious and the most egregious example is, of course, totally anomalous connection where all the veins from both lungs drain anomalously to a systemic venous site. It is not always the same site, but the essence of totally anomalous connection is that all the pulmonary veins drain other than to the left atrium. You can, of course, have unilateral anomalous connection when all of the veins from one lung drain anomalously, or you can have partially anomalous connection when part of one lung drains anomalously. And it's possible to have combinations of unilateral and partially anomalous connection. And also, as I say, with totally anomalous, it can be possible to have the veins draining to different sites, which we call mixed totally anomalous connection. So any combination of the above. So let's produce a cartoon to put all that together, because the sites of anomalous connection are the key to diagnosis. And these can be supradiaphragmatic, either to the superior cable vein, sometimes to the azagous vein, and thence to the superior cable vein, and also to the coronary sinus. And it's moot then as to whether this channel is an anomalous channel or a persistent left superior cable vein. When the veins drain to the coronary sinus, of course, not only is the anomalous drainage supradiaphragmatic, but it's also cardiac. But in some instances, the pulmonary veins can drain direct to the right atrial chamber, although I have to say that whenever I have seen direct connection, it has always been with isomeric right atrial appendages. And the association between right isomerism and totally anomalous pulmonary venous connection is particularly important, as we will discuss. But then the other variant of anomalous connection is when the channel runs through the diaphragm into the abdomen, and then that can be either to the portal venous system, in almost all cases, rarely to the inferior cable vein, 
Again, I've not seen a case, but I am aware of well documented within the literature. So let's look first at partially anomalous pulmonary venous connection, said to be very common, although I must admit I have rarely recognized it, but my colleagues in Pittsburgh recognized this case when the rest of the heart was entirely normal. So here we have the right atrium, and we see that the right lower pulmonary veins, along with all the other pulmonary veins, are draining into the left atrium, but here we have the right upper pulmonary veins draining directly into the left superior cable vein. So that can occur in association with otherwise normal hearts, but is much more significant when it's associated either with scimitar syndrome, the essence of which is sequestration of a lobe of the lung <coughs> along with anomalous arterial supply, and then it's necessary to describe arterial connections, venous drainage, and bronchial morphology, or with the sinus venosus interatrial communication, which we will discuss tomorrow. And in that, in that situation, the anomalous pulmonary veins are usually to the superior cable vein, but can also be to the inferior cable vein. And as we will discuss, the essence of this malformation is that the interatrial communication is out of lines of the oval fossa. But let's concentrate our attention now on totally anomalous pulmonary venous connection. And here is a nice example of supracardiac connection to the superior cable vein, having once more performed the Tausig maneuver. So the heart that was initially here has been deflected out of the pericardial cavity, and we see the pulmonary venous confluence with an ascending channel joining the brachiocephalic vein to the superior cable vein. So here we see the same situation with the heart in its pericardial cavity, and the combination between the ventricular mass and the anomalous systemic venous channel gives us the situation which we can look at from the back, and we see that we can create a snowman between the ventricular mass and the anomalous venous channels. In the old days in the United Kingdom, we used to call this a cottage loaf arrangement. But nobody these days seems to know what cottage loaves are, so I guess we'll stick to snowmen, because everybody understands snowmen. So a nice pattern, which is well recognized from the chest radiograph, although perhaps the chest radiograph these days is becoming as obsolete as the cottage loaf. Okay. There is one variant that warrants distinction, and that is when the ascending channel, rather than running up the left paravertebral gutter, runs up the right paravertebral gutter. Again, I'm showing this, you the situation here, having performed the Tausig maneuver. So the heart has been deflected away rightwards from its pericardial cavity. And you see now that the left veins are running across beneath the heart, picking up the right lower veins, then running up the right paravertebral gutter, picking up the right upper veins and opening into the azagous vein. And this is an important variant of supracardiac connection, even though the channel is ascending from beneath. And in this instance, again, there was isomerism of the right atrial appendages. But isomerism of the right atrial appendage is particularly important in the setting of cardiac connection. Because always, when this is directly to the right atrium, in my experience, the appendages have been isomeric and of right type. So I would always suspect right isomerism if pulmonary veins are coming back directly to the right atrium. But we need to differentiate connection to the coronary sinus, as you see here, because this is almost certainly the commoner form of cardiac connection of the pulmonary veins. We're looking at the heart from behind, and we see left atrium and pulmonary veins, and we see that rather than draining into the left atrium, the veins are joining into the cardiac coronary sinus, which then drains through an enlarged orifice to the right atrium. And then finally, infracardiac, infradiaphragmatic connection, as I've emphasized, usually to the portal venous system. And the key feature here is that once the venous duct closes, there is gross obstruction to pulmonary venous flow. Very rarely to the inferior cable vein, and I repeat, I've never seen it, but it does exist. So this is what the situation looks like. Again, we've performed a Tausig maneuver. The heart has been deflected from its pericardial cavity. 
And so we can see now the confluence in Christmas tree fashion with the vein now descending downwards, perforating the diaphragm, and as we see in the continuation, running down and ending in the portal venous system. And be aware that on occasion, the vein itself, having penetrated the, the diaphragm, can break up into a series of venous channels which themselves produce obstruction. And it is obstruction which is another important part of the conundrum of anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. And there is always going to be obstruction when there is infradiaphragmatic drainage subsequent to closure of the venous duct. Rarely there can be drainage to the coronary sinus with obstruction produced by a persisting Thebesian vein. But the interesting feature is called bronchopulmonary vice with supracardiac connection. And here you see the essence of the bronchopulmonary vice. The venous channel has come together and is going superiorly, but the vein passes between the pulmonary artery and the bronchus, and that produces the vice-like grip on the pulmonary venous channel. And here you see a nice example of such a case, again subsequent to the Taussig maneuver. The heart has been reflected. Here are the pulmonary arteries. There is the bronchus. And you see the ascending channel trapped in the bronchopulmonary vice. 